welcome to this very special conversation from the Australian Writers Guild with the playwright Susie Miller and me, Melanie Tate. This is a, a conversation about building international connections. Firstly, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and we recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd like to welcome all AWG members and non-members who are joining us for the very first time. And also to thank Screen Australia for their support in helping make this webinar possible. Now, I just wanted to let you know, attendees, that the chat function is not going to be monitored down the bottom, but the Q&A is live. So if you've got questions for Susie throughout this process, just whack some um, questions in the Q&A and we'll try and get to them towards the end of this conversation. And also this recording is going to be recorded and it'll eventually make its way onto the Australian <laughs> Writers Guild site. Look, I'm so excited to introduce to you tonight our very special guest, a guest who has unique experiences for those of us who are playwrights or screenwriters mm -hmm. or both. Susie Miller has a background that qualifies her beautifully for the intelligent, challenging, provocative and entertaining play she's known for. She started out as a scientist and then she moved into human rights law, but <laughs> came and joined us in the trenches of communicating ideas with audiences to be a playwright. Susie's CV is exceptional. We can't possibly get to it all in this short introduction, but she's had plays, 40 plays, 40 productions, uh, or 40 productions of her plays performed all over Australia and the world. She's had two residencies at the National Theatre in London, two at the National Theatre in Scotland, She's worked and learned from theatre practitioners right across the English speaking world. And her screen career is now really taking off as well with projects in the UK, the USA and Australia all in development with production companies that quite frankly, we'd all sell our mothers to work with. Um, if you think that this has happened by accident or by blind luck, you couldn't be further from the truth. It's come from hard work, from grit and from a conscious decision to build connections and a career beyond Australia. The other thing about Susie is this, in an industry that can sometimes feel very <laughs> ungenerous, where it's tempting to jealously guard the very few opportunities offered to us in a smaller creative landscape like Australia, Susie is the opposite of ungenerous. She is the most supportive colleague. She's a generous one, which <laughs> makes her loved and in demand in our industry. We're going to divide this conversation in half, if that's possible, half on playwriting and half on screenwriting, and then we're going to open it up to your questions. Susie Miller, welcome to this oh. Australian Writers Guild chat. Mel, thank you so much. It's okay. lovely to be part of the Guild, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's really yeah. fantastic. And to be here tonight in what I feel like since we uh, started planning this over the weekend is a really genuinely exciting prospect for our members uh, to, to learn something and, and kind of, I felt changed after chatting with oh. you the other day. I can't yeah. imagine how our writers are going to feel after this. Absolutely. Well, I hope well, I deliver. Well, you will. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Let's get straight yeah. to it, Susie, because we don't have a whole heap of time tonight, unfortunately. Yeah. Like we could be, this could be a five hour seminar, really. Yeah. Um, can you take us to the moment or the cumulative moment that you realised a career in Australia perhaps wasn't going to sustain you artistically and financially? Absolutely. And um, things are different now, although not at the height of what they should be by any stretch. But when I first entered the profession of theatre, I came from law, which um, had lots of barriers for women's entry and lots of barriers for anyone that wasn't sort of in a completely mainstream circle. Um, but also it had barriers that you could actually see where they were, as in if you weren't smart enough or you couldn't earn the kind of cash or you couldn't win in court, you couldn't get there. So women had, even though it was one of the most conservative profession, one of the most conservative professions, what was interesting to me is that it was harder in theatre than it was in law and harder as a woman in theatre than it was as a woman in law. And so that was because of this concept of taste and this idea that the artistic directors at the time weren't programming women based on the fact that they didn't think their plays were good enough. Now, I knew for a fact that couldn't be the case because I'd read some amazing women plays and they weren't being programmed. And I thought, I can either give up my whole other career for this career where I won't get opportunities or I can test the water and see whether my work is good enough with other kind of companies looking at it to see whether I should continue pursuing it. And in order to do that, I had to reach further out than Australia because Australia was 10, 10 years behind other countries in terms of programming women. 
So um, I basically opened a strategic file to test the waters. Um, I had a play that I'd written that had been to every theatre company in Australia and been rejected. And all playwrights will know that rejection is very a very big part of being a playwright and a writer in general. Um, so then what I did is I decided I would find producers that might be interested in, in it overseas. I opened a file on that. <laughs> and also, we're lucky in Australia that we have the Adelaide Fringe Festival, where there's a lot of international producers that come every year. Producers that you might not be able to get hold of if you were in their home country, but because they're in Australia, they're actually quite open to having conversations. But the most important thing that I do want to emphasise right through this talk is that being strategic, as in you don't just open up and you don't just send an email to every producer that's going, you actually study the form guide on all fronts. So you'd study the form guide of which international producers are coming to the Australian scene and decide which ones actually suit you, not just which ones are available, but which ones what their ethos is, you find out something about them, something about what they've produced and whether you like them enough to want to trust them with your work as well. And I think that's the first step is to actually really do the research on each producer. And when you approach them, you're there with a lot of information about them and a lot of reasons why you want to work with them. So you're actually going in at a higher level than just a kind of free for all email. So I did that with this play and actually it got produced overseas in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival, which was another step into that international foray as well as in New York. And both of those productions went extremely well. And one and the New York production actually won an excellence in playwriting award in New York. So that made me think, okay, this is a play I couldn't get on in Australia, even at Downstairs Belvoir or any sort of independent production anywhere. So it's actually Australia that's limiting me, not my work per se. And that's the, and a writer needs to have some objective proof of that, or else it's really hard to actually put all your in the basket of writing and going forward. So for me, I, it made me realise that I have to diversify my practice in terms of not just being Australia, it has to be overseas as well, because then you actually open up the possibilities for your work and your audience. So that was my first step was being strategic about doing that. But I think, I think people don't realise that if you do the research, you actually start to look at your career as a management of your career and you actually invest in it in your own way. So you invest in it with your own energy in all those hours that you're sort of really moping around saying, how do I go that next step? You actually do some research and really that reaps amazing rewards for me in particular, but I think for most people it would as well. I want to flip back before we go on to the diversification of your career and just look very practically at that Adelaide Festival experience. Yeah. You know, many writers, um, the thought of the open, you know, the opening night networking and the like can put terror through their souls and hearts. Um, yeah. What... And, and on the flip side of that, many writers have an agent who they think will do all that stuff for them. Yes. yes. What, I mean, what, what is your experience of that? And can you tell us from a practical level, like you said, you go through the, the program like it's a form guide. I mean, are you sending cold emails to these producers? Yeah. Are you arranging coffees? What, what's the practical? Absolutely. I think, I think that's a really good question because it's kind of a mixed one to answer. But first of all, when you're a really junior playwright, you sometimes have an agent. I did have an agent, but when you're very junior, and it's a different agent to the one I have now, but when you're very junior on somebody's books, you don't really get that level of management or that level of output to everyone, especially overseas as well. So basically I just thought, well, I'll use the skills that I obtained in other professions to see how you would actually research what, what's out there, what's available, who actually picks up plays. And so when I say I read the form guide, I mean, the Adelaide Fringe Festival was what was available to me because it's an international festival in our own country. And I hadn't been overseas with my work yet. And I went to the Adelaide Festival, but I read all of the plays that were on. Like I read through the form guide, the guide, the program, and found out which ones were international and who was producing them and whether I liked that type of work. And, uh, and then I would go online and research that particular producer and see what else they'd done. The fact that they were prepared to come to Australia and invest in Australian audiences and Australian um, creatives was an interesting start because it meant if they were in Adelaide, then they also want to put something back with Australian artists. So it's actually a really good place to go and do that research. And they're looking for new emerging strong voices as well. So it's actually quite a good way to do it. Um, and I think the other thing is that I had another profession and everyone else in theatre has another profession at some stage, but I basically really saved my money to actually invest in my career. I thought I'll give it a certain amount of years. I will invest in it. I will invest in air affairs. I will invest in, you know, making applications for grants and philanthropic organisations and production organisations. I will put in the hard yards with some of the companies here that I really like that was sort of a Tamarama Rock surface in Sydney was an amazing start for me in many ways. 
Um, it was a collegiate atmosphere of really hot artists that have done brilliantly, but it was a very small group of people and they actually wanted to support one of my plays going overseas. So they put their name to it and gave me some initial funding. So in many ways it was done on a string of an oily rag, but it was actually done at a professional level. And it was produced by somebody else, but I was there to sort of make sure my play got off. And then I accompanied my play to the productions. And when I was there, I made other connections. So you make one connection and then you build on those. So is it, in this, in this case as well, did you write a play specifically to be able to be in Edinburgh, you know, to, to have yeah. like a small cast to, to I get think, the stars? Yes. The the Great line? question. So my very first play ever was a play that had sort of 50 characters and 12 actors. It was at the old fits. Can you imagine backstage there? People on each other's shoulders. It got funding. It seemed like a really easy thing to do. It then transferred to the opera house. I thought, great, this is an easy career. Let's just do this. And then I realised how hard it was. And my, then I, so I did some research and realised that my initial play with so many characters and so many actors was actually ludicrous. And it was an amazing, it was a fluke that that one actually took off and flew. Um, but really, if you actually make smaller casts, you can take them overseas and test the waters there. And this play with the, with the smaller cast, I'd actually written at the same time as I was writing the very large one as a sort of practice run to see how I went with a small hand to play. And then sent it everywhere in Australia on the back of the one at the Opera House, but it just didn't get any bites. And it was in that particularly closed period in Australia. It was very close to women playwrights. There were very few programmed. And, and I thought, well, this is actually small enough that I could pitch it to producers that, go, that take work overseas. And basically, it was a UK producer, and then it was part of the New York Fringe Festival for another producer over there. And I think and Tamarama Rock Surface supported the one that went to New York. So it was the same play, two different casts, different productions, and two different audiences, and also had, had their own successes. So the play itself... I came back to Australia thinking, I know my work actually works mm. and it creates an audience and it is of a certain quality. So now I'm prepared to invest further in my work by doing less work in law and more work in theatre and, you know, like really bunking down and doing the research for other producers and other ways to reach out. The great thing about starting that, though, is I got to Edinburgh. Once you're there with a production, you get invited to all the artist parties. You're in all the special bars where all the artists congregate. People see your work. People approach you. Um, and I got like three commissions out of that. So that was the three overseas commissions from different countries in the English speaking world. So you go, wow, that was worth the airfare over there and sleeping on the floor of Emma Jackson's, <laughs> Emma Jackson the actor's um, bedroom, just so that I could actually, I, I could actually leverage further productions on going from there. So making those, turning that Edinburgh experience into three international commissions, plus, uh, you know, the residencies you've had with the National and, and the National Theatre of Scotland. How much of that is about being in the right room at the right time and saying the right things? Like, how, what sort of follow-up do you have to do? I mean, do you have to stay in the UK for a few months to make those things happen? You know, not really. I mean, those things happened to me before I moved to the UK and then they started happening further when I was in the UK. But I think it's about being in those rooms with other sort of people that have risen to that level with you who are looking to do other work and have different contacts. And so you all share your contacts around, as in the people that commissioned me then said, we'd like to take this one to the national because it's the sort of thing they're looking for. Um, would you mind if we pitched it to them to do a residency there? Would you come back over? And I went, yeah, of course I would. Like, some national, do you know what I mean? And then from that one, another res I got another residency out of that. And I have to say that even if you don't get an attachment to a major theatre or you don't get invited into a, like the national or whatever, like residencies and like volunteer, volunteer attachments are a really great way to go. They really allow you to get to know, a really, it's a warm referral to a company. Right. So like the residencies I've done have really changed the nature of my work in many ways and it's allowed me to diversify my practice as a po and also different places in the globe. So I think, and a residency is so much fun. You get to really focus on your work. You meet other artists who nearly always have other things to offer you or other people that they introduce you to. I mean, through one of an artist at the various residency, I ended up talking to someone from the Chabonne in um, Berlin, which led to other kind of conversations. So every, I mean, my, my theory has always been let something, let everything lead to something else. Like always like be alert to what's possible in the scenario to lead to the next conversation with someone that you might want to work with and be really open to saying yes, rather than, oh, I'll have to see if I can do it. Just be really open to going, yeah, I'll find a way to make that happen. 
What are the differences or are there differences between doing a workshop and a residency overseas compared to Australia? Like, is there a difference in the room or, or are we all fiat? Yeah, no, no, totally, totally different. It's completely different. So, yeah, really different, actually. Um, being in a workshop in a room in London is very different to being in a workshop in a room in Australia. And there's just a different protocol and the same in the States as well or in a TV room in different countries is really different as well. Um, but I think that's less more about the sort of cultural way that they've grown up in the industry than much more. Well, what the, the only difference you really need to know about is that the way that you actually get into these organisations. There's not that many residencies in Australia. There's very, very few, whereas there's so many in the UK. And I don't mean the National or the National Theatre of Scotland, but there's lots of places that you can apply for. There's websites and you can just crawl through the net to find really interesting residencies. Uh, often they're international because there's Europe and the UK connected in many ways, so it used to be. Um, and, um, and so there's ways that you, you move into those, those residencies, but the other residencies are the ones that are attached to theatre companies and they're really brilliant. I mean, it's about reaching out to theatre companies that you feel you have something to offer to them and that you want to learn something from them. So I always had this thing that I really wanted to learn from Robert Lepage in Quebec City and I basically did every bit of research. I mean, I was quite obsessed with him for a few years in terms of his work. And so I read everything, watched everything, and then wrote him a letter and said, this is why I want to come and be attached to you. And he invited me to be attached there for three months, which was an incredibly long period of time and for which I had to learn to speak French. But I wanted to do it so much, I did those things to do it. Yeah. And, um, and I learned a lot. And while I was in residency there, there was another theatre company in residency that invited me to work with them in Toronto. So it just becomes a kind of grapevine of, of meeting and greeting and, and finding out what you have in common with people and finding out why you want to work, go to a particular residence or why you want to go to a particular theatre company. So, Suvi, this, this an enormous experience overseas, I wonder if it translates back home because, you know, there's that great thing in the film industry, certainly, that when they've got a new Australian film, they'll take it to Venice and they'll take it all over the world before it opens in Australia because yeah. we have this kind of cultural cringe th thing where, yeah. you know, we'll only love Muriel's wedding if somebody else loves it first. That yeah, it's so of, true. Is is there any like has has that also been the same case in your theatre career, or or has it been that Australia has opened ever so slightly the door to women playwrights? I think both. I think first of all, when I first came back, there was a slight. Oh, sorry, I, I moved to London for a period of time because I, I actually got offered a residency at the National Theatre in London again. And so I went for that and we, my family moved over for a year so that I could really indulge in those opportunities. Um, and while I was over there, there was a lot of discussion about women in theatre and a lot of, um, there was an outcry in the papers and people really made it. And so I was very much part of that, but from overseas. So I felt very confident speaking out because I wasn't biting the hand that fed me at the time, which was great, actually. It made you very free to actually speak very clearly and without being antagonistic, but just explain what the difference was. Um, when I came back, I noticed it was a bit, well, there was an awareness, which was already a, you know, a huge step and things were starting to change. There was a question of quotas that was in some sort of debate. Um, but also when I came back, you do realise that going to London and coming, or going overseas and working overseas and coming back, there's two things. The first thing is that and maybe this is why you're more interesting to Australians, but you're more confident. You have a much greater grasp of what your kind of expertise is, um, who your audience is. You have a stronger sense that your work, if it's been received well overseas, that it should be received well in Australia. As in, it, it, you know, surely there's an audience here if I've got one overseas. So you come back with a, sort of a sense a sense of possibility. And I think maybe that rubs off and people actually want to hear about your experience and what you've learned. But I think also there were definitely more doors opening because, um, because it had changed a little bit. But I think also just that cultural cringe thing, it was interesting to have a perspective of someone that lived overseas. Before we do move on to screenwriting, because time flies when you're having fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. Um, the, what do you think of the landscape now? And I, I wonder this because uh, I've attended, oh, I think we've all noticed in, in the theatrical landscape here, in, certainly in the state theatre companies or the state theatre company, there doesn't seem to be a huge turnaround in terms of artistic directors and literary managers who are making the decision. So if a mm. literary manager or a, theater, a artistic director decides that they don't like your work, that could be 15 years mm. easily that you're not played in that theatre. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. I think that's really problematic in a way. It's different in the UK. It feels like there's a lot more turnaround. Our literary managers turn around constantly, actually, in the UK, and they move from theatre to theatre. 
Um, and artistic directors change much more, much more often than they do in Australia. Having said that, you know, we've actually had a lot of change in artistic directors of recent times. We've got Lee Lewis running this Queensland Theatre in, Queen, in Brisbane. So that's a woman running like a major, one of the majors. Um, uh, you know, like, and I mean, Kit Williams has only been at SDC for a couple of years now. And so that, that, that has changed. But I have to say that, you know, like, it's, they're not jobs for life. They are jobs for, like, you know, a certain period of time to have, to sort of create a, a legacy and then move from there. Like any job, I guess, except sort of certain positions are the label as, as jobs for life. But the same for literary managers, the same for artistic directors. And it's not enough to talk about the voice of other or the voice of women um, unless you're going to really include them in your practice. And I think that's starting to happen, but I also think that, you know, it's about that, that taste, that, that roar of taste is always going to be there. And it's important in theatre, but it is a double-edged sword. Describe what you, could you just expand a little bit on that? Because you touched on it at the beginning, that yeah. taste was something that got in the way. How did you feel that taste was being used in a, in a sexist way or in a... Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is actually something that was very commonly talked about way back in 2010, not so much now possibly, but it, you know, in many ways, it's the taste of the artistic director and the literary manager of a company that determines the programming more often than not. So if in fact, say back in 2010, where they didn't think the Australian writers were good enough or they weren't possibly fitting in with their program, what happened was Austra women writers were told they weren't good enough because they didn't fit the taste of that AD. But that AD often had a taste for works that were by people like us, you know, as in by people like them. <laughs> so you're outside of that kind of group. And that's still happening today with, you know, with lots of people. Um, but I, I feel, and, and I think that that's a really important factor. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, for anyone white and for anyone, you know, of a certain, and anyone male. I mean, there's certain things, privileges that, are, that you have. That, um, that mean that you don't see the voice of others as clearly as you would if you were within that voice. So, so, taste, so taste is important and it actually has to be a diverse taste at that top level of choosing, of choosing plays. Mm -hmm. Susie, before we go on to screenwriting, one, one final question about your playwriting career. How do you, so you're very much based back in Australia now, how do you sustain yeah. that? I mean, I know that you've got, I don't know how much you can say, but you've got a yeah. fairly big production happening of Prime Facey in the world. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, well, it should have been on by now, actually, but of course things have changed. And I mean, that's looking at sort of West End Broadway productions. But, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, I'm, I sort of have, I sort of move between the spaces, as in I do go to the UK quite often and I go to LA, not so much New York, to, I wish I could, but, I, you know, like it's closer to go to LA. Um, but the, the new increased Zooming, I mean, this last couple of months, I've spent a lot of time having all the conversations I would have had to get on a plane for and having them online, which is brilliant, yeah. which actually opens up that space for all of us to recognise that now we're all more savvy with that. There's a point where you could actually pitch something to a company in the UK and say, let's get on Zoom and talk about it. And people now, I was saying to someone the other day, it's like you've moved in the same way that as a writer, you work from writing longhand to writing on the computer and suddenly it was an easy transition. In a way, these meetings are now becoming easier to transition onto Zoom, which means we can have a much more global career from home. Great. All right, on to screenwriting now. Um, was you, we touched earlier a little bit on the diversification of your career that you decided upon. So one of those branches is screenwriting. Was that something that was always within your plan or was it something that you kind of realised you'd have to do along the way? No, I think I always loved film. I always really loved film. I didn't actually look to writing film. I diversified within the performing arts. So I diversified in terms of opera, um, theatre and movement theatre and sort of hybrid dance theatre, which, which had text. Um, and I know a lot of my friends went into making and into kind of gamify, gamification of theatre. Um, so I sort of stretched my muscle a bit in that because you have to diversify as an Australian artist. You can't just have one form. So I diversified within theatre. And then, you know, I used to say to people, oh, you can't get a plumber to fix your electricity. Like it's like a plumber and an electrician are different, even though they're both tradies. So screenwriters are writers and so are playwrights, but we're different. But what's happened is that's changed in more recent times. So when I sort of put my toe in television sort of 20 years ago, it was something that I actually pulled it out really fast. I said, I do not want to do TV. But now TV has become a writer's medium. So it's almost like now it's not like plumbers and electricians trying to do each other's job. It's basically like carpenters just creating different works. And um, I've always loved film as an audience for film. And I guess, you know, the, the constraints of film telling a story within a certain time period is the same as theatre. Now, theatre is more about rotting ideas, as we all know as playwrights, 
whereas screenwriting is about storytelling and storytelling in a visual medium. So it is different, but in many ways, it's, um, it's quite a natural progression for playwrights. Now, TV has become extraordinary because if, if you're a playwright that loves writing character, you get free reign. It's fantastic. You get to delve into these characters that you'd normally only spend two hours a night with and actually really, you know, you've created them and you've pushed it down to, to 90 minutes to two hours and you're allowed to stretch that back out to what you had to start with and actually really give them their lived experience. So it is, is actually a really fun thing and it's not as big a jump as people think. I mean, I think that was what was interesting to me. Yeah, did you find that, uh, so that actual jump, like I kind of look at authors of books and, you know, quite often a, an author's book is optioned before it's even been released to... Yeah. Uh, and I don't know many play. You're one of the few playwrights I know whose whose works are optioned for films. Um, it doesn't seem as natural a progression as it is from or for authors. Yeah, I mean, is yeah. There something that no, it's really changing. I think it's really changing. And I think that the I think maybe Phoebe Wallace Bridge has been a wonderful um, like right, uh, yeah. advertisement for playwrights. But um, as in people are seeking playwrights out in those mediums much more now. And that's not that's what I've been hearing all over the world. Um, that you know, playwrights are pretty well trained as writers. I mean, and also to rise to the top in theatre is no mean feat. Even just to sort of know, get a handle on theatre, it's hard. It's not an oh, easy yeah. medium to write. Um, I'm not saying the others are easy by any stretch, but I'm saying that you actually have a rigour that if you bring that with you to screen, it really assists and it gives you a different kind of in to the whole product. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's really interesting is theatre theatre writers are great collaborators because you work so collaboratively with other artists. So being in a TV room with other writers is actually something that's exciting for playwrights because we're so, we love collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so we like the thing to be bigger than just us. Um, I think um, what's interesting is that idea that people talk about novelists having their work optioned for TV and film. When playwrights get their work optioned, they actually are also expected to come along for the writing ride, which is actually really great. Um, and I think that lots of playwrights listening to this, of which I'm sure some, many of them are playwrights, um, dig up your backlist and think about what's possible because I have a backlist that some of those were optioned for film and it makes sense that they were or for TV and it makes sense that they were. But there's other works of mine that I've had just calls about where someone else has, has read it and thought this would be a great TV series and I never would have thought of that. And then when you think about it, you think, you mean I get to actually take that character and play with her for, some, for longer and actually find out more about her? How exciting. That's exciting for me because I already know her. <laughs> so you're the one person as the playwright who knows those characters inside out and novelists, of course, know their own characters inside out, but they're not necessarily dialogue writers so they haven't actually embedded a lot of issue like a whole lot of elements in the subtext that they can now stretch out further and actually dig into in a sort of in-depth tv series so so you're perfectly poised is what i'm saying as a playwright to actually right. really discover yeah what great news for everybody tonight <laughs> um you you mentioned we, we talked about theater how you built those international connections it was very um planned very precise did you do something similar to make the connections with film companies and makers? Uh, or, or by the time you're doing that, are you so established you've got some manager who's doing no, it? No, well, no, I've got an amazing manager and an amazing agent in London. Absolutely, like my agent and manager here are brilliant. And my, so that really helps, there's no doubt about it. But my first jump into that area was actually basically just deciding the same thing, thinking I would like to make these sorts of films I would like to make them with these sorts of people who I've watched work overseas and, um, you know, like, in, and producers that have created work that I love. So I'm not just going to look around what's available and you don't jump at the first offer. You actually go, this is the one that makes me feel right about this project. And that sounds like we've got millions of offers coming in and we're picking and choosing. And of course, that's not always the case. But I think if you really believe in your work and you really believe in your story and if you've got a reason for telling your story other than just to make money, then you have to look after it. It's one of your children. You're not just going to leave it with anyone. And I also think that if you really believe in it, there is a market for it. Now, how you find that market is probably what everyone's thinking and asking right now. And I really get it. But I remember the first time I went to Hollywood is I did the same thing. I researched like hell. And I thought, I want to work with, I remember thinking, I want to talk to female producers that really get these issues. And I remember looking up the Sundance top young aspiring female producers in Hollywood and like read up on them all and figured out which ones I'd like to meet, thinking I've only got time to meet with two, but I'd like to choose two that I think, yeah, your people I'd really like to have a conversation with and consider talking with later. 
And so I knew a lot about them. When I read, when I drafted the email, it's not just a quick email. It really is an introduction to me, an introduction to why I like their work and a question of, and so it's what I call a warm referral as opposed to a cold call. <laughs> you actually position yourself to say, I really like your work and I hope that you might like mine. I'm going to send you this to read, but I'd love to meet up with you. I'm here for these particular days, which is going to be four days or something. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about Americans is one, they love Australians. And two is they're very open to that, those conversations. And once you're in the room, I mean, you talk about your work. That's the one thing you know about and that's what they want to hear about. Susie, uh, just before we go on, I wanted to remind our Zoomers or our watchers or our listeners, I'm not sure what the official term is for that, but if you want to ask Susie a question, if you could get it in the Q&A, please, because unfortunately we probably won't get to the chat line tonight, but I will monitor the Q&A when we get into the Q&A. So Susie, in terms of the work that you have to have ready for these meetings and yeah. uh, the pitching things, do you need to have an entire... Um, like an entire 15 page treatment and 80, no, 90 no. page screenplay, what do you need? That's not been my experience. I think if you've got a really great idea and you really, you know, it, everyone wants like the sort of two to three pager to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think you work it up to a two to three pager and you make it so that it's really clear what it is. It's really clear where your passion lies and it's really clear that you can deliver it. And I think most writers who have some experience can do that. But pitching documents is a new thing for playwrights. They've actually come about in the last five to six years in theatre where you're expected to pitch for a commission yeah. rather than just be told you've got a commission. So we're getting more and more used to it. And in fact, a, a great session with the Guild would be a pitching session to create pitching documents. I did a fantastic course actually at Afters like a number of years ago, in fact, 12 years ago. And it helped my playwriting enormously, not to mention the skills that I have in just putting together short documents for film. But those short documents are of many different types. You know, there's one that's just a log line. There's one that's three pages. There's one that's 15 pages. It's a Bible and a whole, there's a whole range of different things, but just actually getting someone excited about your idea is the first point. And so that's about getting on paper what your passion for that idea is and why it has a point of difference to other people's ideas and why you writing it is an important way to go. I mean, people know that, so there's not much point in me really elaborating on that. But I think that going to a meeting equipped with three to four really great pitches and, and, and feeling the room. And if they say something like, you know, like, well, we're really looking for something that's funny. You think I'm going to pull my comedy one out. I'm not going to pull out my really dire, desperate, miserable one. So just working with them, um, just, 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 just having a feel for the room and what you pitch as well. And also just going in there and going, you've got nothing to lose. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're all the one that has the content and the goods. Go in there and say, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to let, talk to you about this or I'm going to send you. And I, I didn't send the copies of the work before I went. I would talk to them and then follow up with the three page or something. So that's an interesting thing. You know, we hear quite often that Americans are kind of like full of lovely shit when you go into um, a meeting that you, you walk out thinking, wow, I'm a genius. This is fantastic. And then you never hear from them again. Are you following up? Is your agent following up? How do you go yeah. from pitch meeting to making a deal? I think it's about finding the right person to pitch to, like someone that actually is interested in, and, and if you've got someone between you and them that can refer you to them even better. I mean, that's hard, I know. But, you know, for example, there are people that have worked at screen organisations in Australia that have contacts all over the world. And it's about finding the person in Australia that knows the person you want contact with and seeing if there's a way to do that. Uh, and there are ways and there's lots of other contacts, bless you. Um, and I think, um, and it, I think it's just not, it's about, not believing in your work and when they sort of go oh my god this is amazing blah 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 <laughs> um really you can tell when someone's sincere or not because they actually ask you good questions about the job about the work and then you know and then you have an agent and a manager to follow up and then you see what goes from there but your manager or agent when they follow up is the one that really does the the deal making as such um but you know that's all it's it's actually you know in many ways there's so many independent producers in australia as well so one of the things that I was going to mention very briefly is also if you don't have producers in Australia, but you know that you can, you've got a work that you really want to work up. I mean, writers don't support each other enough. In a way, if you get together six of writer friends that you're really close to that you think have really different genres and different interests, you could all donate a, weeks of a, a week of a writer's room for everyone else each once a year and yours gets worked up as well. And then you get to have like a really good product to go and shop around and take to people that might actually take it to Hollywood for you or might just take it to somewhere amazing in Australia to shoot because Australia's making a lot more work now and it's really high quality work. So don't forget that those possibilities are open and writers are great to each other and they work really well together. 
and in a way you'll actually have the support of other writers saying, oh, don't take it to them, they'll screw it up. Take it to these people, they know what they're doing or these people have the same politics as you. That's important as well. How important is the producer to the, the process of getting a work in front of a streamer or in front of a network or the like overseas? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really good question because the landscape has changed so much in the last five to ten years, or five, three years even, you know, now that we've got all these streamers. We've even got them in Australia. We have Stan and so forth here that are present really very much here. So I think that in many ways, if you can't get a producer to sort of present your work, there is that point where you can take it to the streamer yourself. I mean, I think I know a lot of writers that have done that, that have packaged it up, that have had friends in a writer's room with them and they've sorted out a way to actually have ownership or whatever. And they, and they can actually pass that line of title onto a streamer directly and actually, and then get a lawyer involved to negotiate the deal. And so that's not, I mean, it's not, it's, it's actually happening more and more overseas as well as that writers are, particularly in TV, taking more control of the process. So it's, so, it's sorry, oh, sorry. Go no, you, I was just going to say, so how much time then are you spending on the, the um, keeping of relationships overseas mm. versus, you know, in the business of being a writer yeah. versus the art of, of actually doing the work? Well, I used to spend a lot more on that, but now I've got a, an amazing manager who does that. So I'm lucky. That's an amazing thing forward for me. And it's actually taken a lot of stress off the daily kind of the emailing that comes and goes. It's also something about what I was saying before about other writers grouping together into groups and working on their work. If you took someone else with you into a room who's a writer friend who's in a producing model with you, they can talk about you in the third person in a way you can't talk about yourself. Yeah, like exactly. I can go in there and say, this is Melanie, she's amazing, she's done this, this and this, I love her story, it's really exciting to me. Whereas it's hard for Melanie to go in there and say, hi, I'm Melanie, I'm amazing, my story. <laughs> so you sort of need that kind of like that buddy system in a way if you're actually going to do work, if you're actually going to bring your work to a streamer. Um, but what you were saying about maintaining relationships, you do have to maintain your relationships. I found though that the ones I made in the UK and now in the US, you know, it's kind of interesting if you really invest in those relationships in the first place, they really keep in touch with you as well because they recognise you're a content provider and there will come a time when the content you're providing and the needs they have actually meet. So that's, it doesn't feel like it, those relationships are as strong in that mode in Australia. Mm -hmm. But I have felt that people have generally kept my relationships going, even people from major theatre companies. When they've left those major theatre companies and gone to other ones, they check in with you. And so it's just about being really responsive to that and recognising that those people are already on your periphery, they're already in your kind of vision. Mm -hmm. And so to just write down the names of all those people and not forget to check in with them when you go to London or wherever. Um, just recently, and this is kind of, I think this is more a playwriting question on those long relationships rather than a screenwriting relationship. I was reading a, a, an American book recently called The Playwright at Work. And what struck me is the way that the playwright in America um, seems to have a much longer career as a so the Paula Vogels mm. and McNally's and people like that their careers mm. are able to grow and become more revered as they get older whereas mm. you can't really pick many playwrights that are allowed to stick around for oh, very it's long terrifying isn't it you're very, right yeah it's very mm. youth focused um well, it's not even youth focus, it's sort of the tyranny of the new in a way. It's not even youth, because I know that when I started playing, I'd already had another career, so I wasn't super young, but I was new, and so people right. want to kind of say, oh, I discovered the new playwright. Yeah. But the thing is, in the UK and the US, I think maybe because they've got commercial theatres, they rec or right. commercial operations, they recognise that this is someone everyone else has invented, it's already, someone's already worked them up to this mid-career level, great, we'll get the reaps of the reward. Whereas in Australia, we forget that there's a reward to be had. <laughs> like they forget that the mid-careers could actually become the great orators of the, you know, of, of the theatre community in Australia and then take that overseas. So there's, I feel that there's not enough investment in that level. Of, I mean, of course, I'm at that point, so of course I feel that. But I have to say that even when I was a junior player, and I remember looking at the people that I admired in Australia and watching them all leave theatre and getting really stressed, going, where are all the people that I'm supposed to follow the career path of? They're not here anymore. Whereas when I'm in London, you know, like, the, the, the speakers about, you know, the people that are called upon to comment on the community, on, on, the, on the government, on sort of issues and, you know, the social commentators are often playwrights. There's playwrights within that, that um, catchment and the same in New York, for example. But it doesn't seem to happen to the same extent in Australia, which is really sad because 
the whole role of playwrights is to interrogate community and actually give it to us organically as it's happening almost, to actually really show us who we are back to ourselves. So they should be in a position where they're called upon to comment on, our, on what's happening in our country, to be part of social debate, because they have, and they have, they have connections to very wide audiences often, not always, I mean, not the mainstream theatres, but there's a lot of people that come into theatre very young and very old. And so you actually, you really understand that audience. Susie, I think we might uh, go to some of sure. our questions now. So just a reminder to our audience tonight, if you've got a question, just pop it in the Q&A, uh, in the Q&A file rather than the chat file, because that's where we're going to be looking at our questions. Yeah. Now, James from the Writers Guild was going to send me questions on my Oh, I shouldn't show my phone. Who knows what's there <laughs> the, on my phone? Uh, so what I'm going to do is read them from there. You'll forgive me uh, because he's sort of not curating, but or curating a little bit, a little bit, just giving them to me in an interesting fashion. So anonymous yeah. question, do you write a little every day or do you write a lot over a smaller span of time? I think I write really intensely. So I will actually lock myself up and write for big blocks and then do a lot of management and then go back and write for some more big blocks. I tend to write a bit every day, but I don't do it in that wonderful way where someone can say, I'll do scene one today, scene two tomorrow. I'm much more into intense kind of, I'm in the mood for a really big all nighter and I'll do that. Yeah. Wouldn't that be the dream to just do scene <laughs> one today, scene two tomorrow, scene yeah. three? Oh, I yeah. want to meet that person. Yeah, oh my too. God. <laughs> um, Kay wants to know, are independent non-attached theatre producers more common overseas? What a great question. Yes, it's a great question. And in the UK, there's loads of independent, non-attached theatre producers that do really great. They produce because there's a lot of regional tours and all sorts of um, collaborations overseas in London or in the UK. Um, in Scotland, there's some fantastic ones that come out of Edinburgh as well. Um, in Ireland as well, there's a lot of independent producers. Australia has some, but I mean, it's, it, it's almost like it's not worthwhile for independent producers in the same way. Unless they've got a lot of funding, it's very hard for them to get something to be self, to be, yeah. to pay for itself. So, but you know, they're hungry for content in the UK for, for new work, for new voices, for work that's tourable. Because they have a lot of touring, which we don't have yeah. as much of. Well, it's interesting, after we spoke last weekend, Susie, about that aspect of the business, I went and did a big Google search and <laughs> found about four um, young women producers who had a West End track record of producing the kind of plays that I feel that I, you know, and so yeah. there are four yeah. people to get in touch with, you know, that kind of... There you go, exactly. And yeah. they're in the UK or they're here? In the UK, yeah. Right. And there's, so, you know, there's a few Australian producers in the UK that are always happy to sort of at least introduce Australian writers to someone that they think would be connected to them. But yeah, I think there's a lot of fantastic young women in the UK. I mean, that not only are they great producers, but they know everything about theatre and they know how to do something on a shoestring and they've often worked at small indie theatres to get the hang of how to become a producer and there's a mentoring program for them in the UK as well. How great is Google too? Yeah, I mean, it's just exactly. the, um, I feel like back in the old days when I started <laughs> out, it wasn't a Google. You'd get, you'd get out the manual for writers and look That's up a right. few agents. Yeah, the Writer's yeah, Handbook, yeah. the Australian Writer's Handbook. Yeah. Um, another question here, uh, this is an anonymous question. My friends and I have written a stage musical, Lucky wow. Ducky. Right. Um, any advice on the next step and where you think it would be the best place to debut, i.e. festivals, amateur debut, Australia, UK or America? Okay, so first of all, rule out the amateur debut because like Aim Higher, you've actually spent a lot of time writing it. You've actually invested yourself and no doubt your, you know, your resources into it. Um, Maybe the best thing is to get someone to read it and give you feedback on it, as in like a proper, like a dramaturg for musicals or an editor for musicals, and then do another, do the pass that you think is the one that you'd like to send out. And then there's, then do your research as to which producers produce musicals you love. And I mean, start at the West End if you want to. I mean, why not? There's no reason why you shouldn't, or Broadway. I mean, but if the thing is that actually just start with the producers that you think they're going to love this and find, and find out why you want to work with them and what their reputation for working um, with them is. I mean, there's some producers I haven't worked with because the reputation hasn't been great, um, you know, as in how they treat their creatives. Uh, but also there's small producers of musicals, particularly in the UK, that will like take a, a smaller musical and, and tour it around. Um, if they love it, if they fall in love with your work, they really go with it. They don't just sort of fall in love with it and move it on. They really go with it. They really invest. 
So, yeah, I mean, it, but it, you really have to do the hard work. You've got to open a file, which is not just the file of the script, but the file of all the people you think would be good contacts for this and actually like do your research on those people and draft a proper email to them, which really explains why you've chosen them. They have to know why you've chosen them. They don't want to just be a cold call either in the same way that you wouldn't want to be a cold call from someone saying, I want to commission you to write a play just because you're the only playwright I know. You want people to love your work and your reason for doing it. So that's, you, you, you sort of bring up a tiny important point there. To know that somebody is going to invest in your work yeah. at, at that level, what do they need to show you? Like, what do they need to show you in order? I mean, do they need to give you a, a, an advance? Do they need to show that they're investing in a workshop, you know, with... Yeah, yeah. I feel, I mean, you know, often it's um, people who are going to, first of all, depending on what the work is, um, but someone that's serious about investing in your work will actually say that they know it has a monetary value and they have to pay for that. I mean, and if it's not, if you're not getting the monetary value, then what you're getting is something else that you need. So for example, you've written a musical. I haven't written, I've, I have written one musical, but not like a musical for the West End or anything like that. But if you, if you write a musical and you think, we think this is great. Um, we've invested so much time in this. Don't forget you've invested all that part of yourself in it. And then you take it to someone who says, I love it. I'm going to advance you this money. And you think, well, those people over there are going to advance, would, might advance me more than that, but I like these people more. So there's a reason I want to work with them. Um, or there's someone that says, I've got no money, but my God, I love this work and I love you. And I think we could build a whole lifetime career together. And maybe you just feel right about them and you think that's worth more to me than the money. I don't know. It's your decision about what you think you really need at that point in your career. Everyone wants the money, but sometimes the money is not the thing that actually ultimately has the long goal. Mm -hmm. Um, Susie Georgia wants to know, she says, I'm a female playwright premiering mm. my first work next February with an independent theatre company. Congratulations, Georgia. Yeah, fantastic. Um, how would you recommend I get my play seen by important eyes? And if the play is successful, how can I leverage that into the next steps of my career? Absolutely. This is a great question because even I learned something about this more recently when someone sort of, uh, someone who's a producer helped me get the right people to see my play and then suddenly everything changed with that play as well. So I think it's really important to start now in compiling a list of the people you'd like to invite to that play. Um, you actually have to buy some tickets for it yourself because it's obviously if it's an indie theatre, there's going to be all sorts of profit share issues, but just buy some tickets now so that it doesn't sell out, particularly towards the end of the run. Yeah. Um, write a list of the people that you would like to see it, the, the film producers, TV producers, theatre producers, the directors that you want to work with in the future, the actors you want to work with in the future, and find a way now to get all of their emails ready so that when you're ready to go, you can, and why you want them to see it. I have watched your work for this long. I particularly liked watching you direct this and this and this. I would love to work with you one day. Please, would you come and see my show? I've got tickets for any day that you would choose to have and I will come meet you afterwards for a drink. And that's it. That's all you have to do. And then when you have that drink and you meet them, assuming they like your work and you have a connection, or even if they don't, they go, that wasn't for me. Say, so, okay, well, I understand why, you know, explain to me why not. Be interested as to why it's not and see yeah. whether there's a future for you, both of you together. But I would compile that list now because February comes around really quickly and it's actually the last thing playwrights do, but it's actually probably the most important thing they should do when they have a show on. Got a question here. I only like pitching projects when I have a first draft and know most of the story. Am I wasting my time writing spec scripts? Well, I think so. <laughs> I mean, if you're actually wanting to sell it, I think... You can write the spec script if you just want to write it because you love writing. And there's lots of things I've written just because I felt like I couldn't not write them and I wanted to write them. And maybe some of those things haven't been on even yet. Um, but uh, if you're actually wanting to have a collaboration with someone, well, the other thing you need to know is that in film particularly, it's not just you, the playwright, that I, you know, it's not just you. Like creative producers are not just money makers. They're actually creative people who want to actually be part of the process and feed into it, which is why it's important to choose the right person, to be honest. Because don't forget, they're not just saying, I will produce you. They're saying, I will produce you, but a bit of me goes into that because I'll feed back on the script. And if you don't like what their work has been before or you don't like their tone or you don't like the way they work, you know, this is going to be someone you have to work with. It's not just someone that's going to give you the money and, and in, in, like to think they're going to make a profit. Often they don't make a profit out of it anyway. So what was the question again? <laughs> oh, yeah, should you write? Yeah. So in, in that way, it's almost like 
sure you can write a first draft and send it to someone if they like it, but you've got to be up. You've got to be open to them saying, look, I wouldn't write it like that. I would have hoped, you know, I would, I would prefer it to be written with this. And, you know, you might feel by that stage you've, you've gone down a road that you don't want to turn back from. Mm -hmm. So in that first instance, when you've got a pitch, if someone says, I love this idea, I'd like to be able to feed into the first draft, I give you like some, you know, get you open to a kind of dialogue or whatever. Sometimes that's exciting, but other times if you just want to write it like you want to write a novel, then write it and shop it around. And if no one buys it, you'll feel good for writing it. I've got a question here from playwright Caleb Lewis. Um, <laughs> what plays should we be writing for a post-COVID theatre? Oh, bless him. Of course he's going to ask me that. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting you say that because... You know, I've been talking to a lot of people overseas and every country seems to have a different view about what the audiences are going to want post-COVID. So in America, for example, the sort of Hollywood view, and they've done audience research, is that people are going to want two things. I mean, not that you're right to colour by numbers or to an audience necessarily, but out of your pit you choose ones that you think okay well people this is the content that people are looking for at the moment maybe i'll put that at the top of my list um and apparently in america they're looking for not just comedy but clever comedy like as in sort of work that really makes you lean in and actually has a sort of element to it of kind of a poignancy or a um you know or just just a sharpness to it that actually says that we're you know it's contemporary um and they're also looking for works that they call escapism so I sort of thought that was like a travel doc. Like, What's this? How do you write escapism? But um, they explained it to me that they're looking for something that takes you out of yourself. So if it's science fiction or if it, even if it's a crime drama, it's going to transport you to another landscape, another way of work, like looking at the world. Um, like, and so, so it's not the kind of um, it's, it's not as it's not as political the work, but it certainly is has to have a spin to it and and be in, set in a place where we actually want to explore or we've never been before so things like top of the lake for example that was a bit of escapism we actually went to that place and thought where are we and we were sort of overwhelmed by the beauty in that first series um, and that would be that was you know that's the sort of landscape to explore so think of really interesting places that you could set something places that you haven't set them before or that people want to go to um, i'm not and this is just what they're saying that they want um, in the uk it's much more about the sort of post post brexit and the and you know really like the jungle just did very very well there which was a play about refugees in Calais, which was amazing. And it was immersive and it was on a theatre that was set up like a, like a refugee camp, which was basically on the West End. So it was kind of amazing. So they're looking for a different way of perceiving the world and a, and a different way of how we exist in the world. I'm much more open to kind of political theatre and political drama. Um, from a TV perspective, they're always looking for the next new voice and they, re they really look towards playwrights. Very, very, they seek playwrights out. And, um, and they actually say, tell me something that's got a point of difference, you know, so, and, and I mean, if you can think of something that you think this work of mine has a real point of difference to anything anyone's ever seen before on TV, the British are really into it. Um, we've got a, a question again from an anonymous attendee. What's the best way to get a screenplay read? Uh, this person says, I hate this question, but I also want to get through the screenplay competitions, grants and literary agents and just have a conversation with someone worthwhile. I feel like getting the foot in the door is the hardest part. What a great question. It's a really good question. Um, so that, that's, that's, and that question is the same for playwrights. There's just two different ways of doing it. But both of them have the same answer. You have to save up $1,000 and you have to pay a really, really good script editor to read your work and start a dialogue with you. They'll give you a report and then you take that report and you respond to that report going, I love this, I don't like that. I wouldn't do that to my play, oh, or my, to my film. This is a really interesting point that I need to expand on in the next draft. And then you can put a report with your <laughs> first draft and send it to producers saying, I've had an independent script editor report from someone amazing. You know, there's really good people in the, I mean, I use someone in the UK that's incredible. And, and basically this is the report from them. And this is the commentary that I've put with the report as to what I agree with and what I wouldn't go forward with. So you can see where the next draft will go. Is it something you would be interested in? And that just gives them the confidence to know that an independent person has read your work and had a dialogue with you of sorts, and that they then will have a different dialogue with you. And at least they're reading your work because they know that you've put some resources into finding out exactly how it's placed within the market and so forth. Mm -hmm. And same with theatre. I mean, I used to, when I used to go and give casual lessons at night of playwrights, the most important thing you can do as an emerging playwright is actually invest in a dramaturg. Pay the money for a dramaturg and get your work looked at, get feedback so you move on to your next draft and make it brilliant. 
and just like wait till we often spend I think as writers we often wait for someone to discover us or to decide they're going to read our work but make it easy for someone to read your work give them something give them a, a point to discuss it with or give them give them a reason to go well you've actually got a dramaturgy report that's amazing we don't usually get that with a play so let's have a conversation about where it could go from here Susie I'm glad we've been given this question because to me you wrote one of the great responses to the Me Too movement in your play, Prima Facie. Now, my, I was saying Prima Facie. What do you say? My well, I say Prima Facie because that's the yeah. legal terminology, but it doesn't yeah. really matter. It's Latin. I mean, I think that's Prima, wrong anyway. <laughs> Prima Facie. Um, yeah. Susie, uh, this uh, question is, given the widespread nature of the Me Too movement, especially in the industry, do you have any experiences with sexism in any respect? And do you have any advice for women in or entering the industry? Yeah, absolutely on both counts. I mean, I don't think there's a woman in theatre that hasn't experienced sexism in theatre, no matter where you are, what stage you're at. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that sexism you won't even be able to untangle because um, it's so entrenched in ways people justify it in terms of why they're not, why they're not engaging with you and so forth. Um, but for me, if it's something that's obvious and overt, I would definitely speak up about it. I feel very strongly about that. I feel like it's about, I mentor so many young women and I don't want them to inherit the kind of theatre industry that you know I actually embarked upon all those years ago. Uh, I used to say, I don't want my daughter to be in that theatre industry that I started out in, which was so denying of women's experience and women's lived experience and women's stories. But my daughter has assured me, she, listen, she's got no interest whatsoever in being a playwright. So now I say it's for my mentees. Um, and, um, and I feel that, that, you know, I just feel like that they now seem to have a stronger voice in speaking up about it and calling it out when it happens. And I feel so inspired by that because I know that there was a sea of silence when I entered and when I'd say things like, I, I don't think they're programming women because there's some, some, some systemic sexism and gendered ideas about stories. And people would think it was just sour grapes because I wasn't chosen, but I was actually really politically agitating about something that seemed so obvious to me having come from the legal profession and thinking, wow, I thought I was in the conservative profession going to the kind of liberal arts. It was the, yeah. and it was the other way around. It was really terrifying. Um, and so I, so I think, yeah, you do speak out, out about it. You speak out to, um, more senior members of the profession to actually support you and they will, you speak to the guild. You, I mean, I've, I've spoken to the guild myself, they've been amazing. Um, if you've got an agent, you speak to your agent. Uh, you don't keep quiet about it. And it actually, you know, ultimately there's a lot of men also in this industry that will support you in speaking out and back you up. And I think that's through a series of education and a series of people that have actually leaned in, lent in to saying, oh, I want to actually make sure that I don't live in a world like that either. And I'm not, not saying all men by any stretch, but I'm just saying you have allies out there. Don't be afraid to seek them out. We're all there. <laughs> um, uh, another uh, message here has come through. How large a body of work produced or unproduced should one have before going down the theatre writing agent road? Will they talk to someone with only a few scripts or work only produced in the regions? Yeah, I mean, they will talk to you. It's whether you want one at that point in your career because, you know, you do take a chunk out of your earnings. And so, um, and, and, and do, would you rather not have a body of work that you can actually, you know, like then have your agent working with you to get that work out there and, and decide? So it's really a personal thing. I mean, I probably had an agent very early on and I look back now and I think, didn't really need a theatre agent that early on because it wasn't like the work comes through the agent at that stage. It comes through your own contacts. But the great thing about having an agent and it is, you know, even as a lawyer, I have to say this because I can't read a contract to be like properly on when it's about me. They do, they, they take that negotiation outside the relation, the creative relationship. So if you're working with a director in a company and you really want to maintain just the creative conversation. Someone else does the money talk. The great thing now, though, is if you're a member of the Guild, for a long period of time, you don't need an agent. If it's a straightforward commission or a straightforward production, you can call up the industry body at the Guild and they will give you that advice. So, you know, it, it's really, it's, it's, I mean, for me, I've always felt really safe and, fair and, and, very, and also because I travel a lot, someone's actually looking out for my interests in the country that I'm not in. So my agent in the UK does the US, UK stuff. My agent here does Australia and they both do America. And I feel very, very supported management wise. But if you don't have a massive body of work or you don't have a lot of contracts coming and going, you know, just, just play it by ear and also wait until you, they're reaching out to you sometimes. It's great when they're actually asking you if you'll come in. 
Um, Susie, it is one past eight. Do you mind if we just, we've got so many questions. Do no, no, it's five fine, minutes. yeah. Is that okay? okay? sure, of course, yeah. Okay, great. We're not, I'm so sorry uh, to the 47 people who've sent questions in, but we're not That's actually cool. going to get <laughs> to all of them. We'll try and just whip through a few more now over the next five minutes. Ariana wants to know, I'm a 75 year old female who has been steeped in music and theater and have yeah. written a major musical that I believe in. Go Ariana. Go Ariana. I yeah, have grown really. in my hometown only. Where do I start? It's a, that's a really- well, What did she say? She's in her hometown she's only? She's known in her hometown only. Well, that's pretty impressive to be known in your hometown. I think that's great. Um, well, I guess I'm assuming the hometown is maybe a smaller town. Is that maybe why she's mentioned she's only known in her hometown? Um, but again, it is about, well, if you're known in your hometown, then ask the people in your hometown what contacts they have in other towns. Like if you're in a smaller town, ask about Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, some of the, or Aubrey or one of the bigger kind of areas up the East Coast or the West Coast if you're in the West. Um, like your network will know someone that will know someone that can help you. Or at least get that dramaturgy report in for your major musical or that, you know, that script editor's report and, and have a sort of rigorous look at your work and then send it out to someone that is really like looking to put a musical on somewhere big, if that's what you're looking for. Or small, you know, like look to an independent producer that, so find those names. Um, when we had Playwriting Australia, there was a lot of support there for finding producers that were doing independent work, for matching people up with directors and so forth. That organisation's gone for now. Um, there is Auscript that might be able to help you at this point. And certainly the Guild has some kind of, they've got a network and a board that could actually help you find someone that you could actually send your work to. But it really is up to you. It's really, you have to be the manager of your own career. If you sit back and wait for people to do things for you, you'll be sitting back waiting for a long time. You do have to lean forward and decide if it's worth putting all your life's energy into, then it's worth actually doing that extra management around it to make it happen. Um, Adriana, I know you didn't ask me, but also get in touch with the Hayes Theatre. They're wanting to develop. Oh, of course, yeah. I have to say, musical theatre is not my expertise. Yeah, it's, my, it's my life's obsession. It is, it is. So, yeah. so yeah, one day I'll write one too. Um, yeah. So another question here from, I just, uh, hi Susie, would you have any further advice for emerging Aussie screenwriters wishing to work in the UK in particular? Yeah, I think, you know, the UK is just hungry for content at the moment. It's a really great place to send your work. And again, get it up to that point where you've got a UK script assessment from someone that's like a commercial script editor, someone good that gives you a report um, and then take that with you, research all those different independent producers in the UK. And there are often, there's also ones in the UK now that all the big ones in the US have offices in the UK where they're looking specifically for something that has a sort of UK tone to it. So um, I think it's a great time to be marketing yourself in that particular area. So, re so do that research, like go onto Google and just absolutely look for the lists of independent film producers in the UK or like not even independent ones, commercial film, but you know, like whatever you're looking for and do the research as to which I, I usually start with women because I want to support women. <laughs> and so, and I think that they will, I just feel like that's a really good place to start. Who are the top women that have made it to an area where they're hungry and passionate and want to do great work? And I reach out to them often. And then, and sometimes there's some men that I've heard about that I've really watched their trajectory and their career and think, God, they're doing great stuff. I really, so whatever you love that's coming out of the UK, go to those people. Susie, I've had a lot of uh, questions. A lot of people ask, is any of this possible? And this is from Katie, but a lot of people have asked this question. Any of this possible without an agent or a manager? Yeah, totally. It absolutely is possible. I mean, honestly, um, I have lots of these contacts with people before I send it to my agent. So yeah, it is actually, again, about saying, okay, there's these four companies in the UK that I love their work. They're the ones I would most love to produce my work. I will send a package to them and a covering email saying, this is who I am. This is what I would like to do. And you know, they don't even seem to mind if you don't have an agent, to be honest. So don't let that hold you back from actually pushing yourself forward. Susie, uh, final question I think we've got time for. This is from Martin. He wants to know, I'm curious to see how long it took you to get to the point where you were actually earning a living from writing. How were you able to support yourself in those emerging years? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so um, Martin, I was a lawyer before I was a writer and, you know, I worked like a dog through law school and worked as a lawyer. And then I actually went part-time as a lawyer so that I could write for the other five days of the week or other four days of the week. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really was a passion of mine. So I really pushed my other things out of my life to do that. But working part-time allowed me to pay for some of those things that I've talked about. 
um, and I know that a legal job pays better than others, but I was actually a human rights lawyer, so it didn't. <laughs> uh, and I think the other thing is that um, at a certain point, you, you actually do start to live off your writing. I have to say that, you know, you might earn as much as I did in the other profession, but you actually work more hours to get what the same, the same income. Having said that, um, you know, you, you learn to live in a different way and you learn also to, um, I think you actually learn that your, your income is in, is in, in big spurts and then little spurts. So you tend to rationalize it throughout the year. Uh, there's other things that you can do. You can get scholarships and, and, and sort of fellowships as well that actually keep you going as well. And that really helped me in that transitional period where I wasn't doing as much film and television. So I was only relying on theater commissions and the, the Australia Council and some of the funding. And there's lots of little funding organizations that you can go to for bits and pieces along the way. Also um, private schools in particular and Catholic schools will uh, commission playwrights to write plays for their for their year, um, you know, their year tens to twelves, and that's one of the great sources in those early years of actually making a living. I keep hearing about these, Susie. <laughs> do, you, do you just cold call? No, oh, no. A private school? Or what are you no, doing? No, no. They sort of, they sort. Of, I guess they must reach out to someone to ask, you know, who could they commission or whatever. Yeah. But I don't. It's and I do know playwrights that actually do actually you know no drama teachers that they say you know i could actually do that with your comp with your school um so there must be some and, and often i do know that there's times i've done master classes that drama teachers have been in the room and they've asked other people in the room oh would you come to our school i mean so i mean if they're going to commission a play that's that's a different thing that has to be on the guild the guild um rates but they also have playwrights come in and master classes with them <laughs> is that you <laughs> oh. It's somebody that clearly doesn't know I'm doing something very important. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, I mean, again, that's another thing of like just, I mean, I, mean, I know Alana Valentine, who's one of our absolutely most praised playwrights in this country. She, she goes to museums and, and write, she, especially in her earlier years, I mean, she had so many fantastic museum commissions where she wrote beautiful pieces that went with various um, exhibitions to museums. So there is, there's work to be found. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not easy. It's about how much you want it. It's about how much you want to be in this profession. And if you're not, if you have had it, I don't think you should be because it's not an easy profession to actually just like stay put in. There's a lot of discouragement along the way. But if you know other writers and you make connections with directors, you will feel like you have a really great community and you will have one. And that kind of makes up for the bad times. Susie, it has been such a delight chatting with you tonight. And, and you. Oh, oh just you. so inspiring. Like, I feel like we're all going to go away and have amazing careers and we'll... You're all going to go on back. Google. <laughs> yeah, we'll bring it back yes. this night. Oh, we'll bring it back please. Tonight. I hope um, so. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you to everybody who's... Thank you, everyone. I don't even know how many people are out there, but thank you to them yeah. all. <laughs> well, we've, got, we've, we've had around 150 people throughout the night. It's amazing. Oh, Lord, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'd also like to thank the team at the Australian Writers Guild. Like, yeah, me thank too. Thank you for putting this together because it's been, it's been a wonderful series of webinars that, that they've been putting together over lockdown. Susie, Caitlin, Jane, Shannon, thanks for making this happen. Realising how important these conversations are for playwrights and screenwriters and bringing us together as a community as we, you know, we prepare, we regroup, we look forward to life after COVID-19. Yes. And of course to Screen uh, Australia for supporting this webinar as yeah, well. Good on them. So, and listen, yeah. if you're not a member of the Guild, join, because that's one of the big peak communities of our writers' organisation. Our writers' life is being part of the Guild. Absolutely. Solidarity. <laughs> Solidar so, shall we sing solidar Solidarity Forever? To say <laughs> I, I can't sing. You're the musical theatre person. Yeah. <laughs> so, so hopefully we'll, we'll be having more of these in, in the future. Yes. Um, my name is Melanie Tate. I just realised I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. Um, Susie Miller has been our very special guest. Watch the Australian Writers Guild's website for more events in the coming weeks. And thank Brilliant. you so much for your time. Thanks, Thanks Melanie. Bye, Thanks everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.